Thank you. So exactly, today I'm going to speak to you using language, because I can. I mean, because of this ability as humans, we can transmit our ideas across space and time, and I hope that's going to happen now. Um, our ability to communicate doesn't necessarily mean that we always understand each other, even if we speak the same language. It can happen among the stakeholders of a project. Just to pick a random example, lighting design. So normally the owners uh, do not have a vocabulary that allow them to uh, specify a lighting design. Um, maybe the architect has one, uh, but often it's not the same as the engineer, nor as a lighting designer. So all the stakeholders in a project have questions. And what happens is that sometimes the answer can be unsatisfactory due to misunderstandings. Um, for example, if I talk about applying wall grazing to a facade, uh, the architect could think of a uh, wall washer, for example. Take uh, light pollution instead. This notion is part of common knowledge. Uh, nowadays, and since the general public started using the appropriate terminology, maybe more, more people have been thinking about it. So, is it possible to learn from this example and improve our communication? Uh, sometimes the relationship between the owner, the architect and me as a lighting designer is based on trust, not on understanding through a common language. So, are you experiencing the same struggle as I do? I'm wondering, what if we started talking about the ceiling as the fifth facade instead? What if we'd compare the ceiling again to a canopy of trees and their different density in foliage as the light passes through? Would the client understand us better then? So, I strongly believe that the way we describe lighting design should make sense for the general public. An easily understandable language could contribute to raise awareness of lighting design and maybe empower our potential clients. I'm very grateful to Kerem, to the journalists, to the marketing people, especially in IALD, who inspire us in communication. Maybe together we can educate our clients while adopting a non-academic vocabulary accessible by everyone. Now, of course, that isn't just English. There are about 7,000 languages spoken around the world. Some linguists think that the language we speak shape the way we think, that the terms we use influence our thoughts, maybe also about light, so, let's give a closer look to words related to light in different languages. The original concept of light referred to what we can experience with our visual sense. At the same time, words for light are very old in the development of language. I'll introduce you to unique, beautiful words today, and please forgive me in advance for my pronunciation. Um, it is true that in linguistic, the link between the terms and their meanings is arbitrary, okay? So this makes even more interesting for me how halo became multilingual, a word that exists in several languages. Other Greek, Greek words like adilia aren't so common, uh, even if many can relate to this uh, glary, overcast sky. Um, here, I'd also like to mention sun sun is a Japanese word um, that stands for a lot of sun rays shining through the clouds. Uh, it's similar to lama di luce in Italian, um, it's like light, bl light blades. Not to be confused with my favorite Japanese word, komorebi, that sunrise filtering through the foliage and casting shadows on the ground. Now, Caustics is an exception, uh, at least for me, it's used in physics to describe the effect of reflection or refraction by a curved surface or object. This is my favorite phenomenon, and after mentioning it uh, a few times, now also my friends uh, use it. 
I love the verb glisten, to shine with a trembling light that gets reflected on a surface, and a variation that's shimmer from Old English shimmerin. Uh, it has Germanic origin, and it's related to shimmerin, also to shine. Now, look. Many languages have a word for dawn, but only French and Spanish have a word for dawn serenade. Um, Italians aren't early birds, maybe, because they only have notturno, literally nocturnal, a song to the night. Only German has a word for the red color of the sky around sunset. It differs from afterglow, that's a broad arch of pinkish sunlight in the sky. In Hungarian, Aranid is a word for the sun that creates a golden bridge. We can't translate it as sun glade, nor as sun pillar. When the moon reflects in the water, in Hungarian you say silver bridge, while in Swedish, Mongota is the moon road. Uh, a Japanese word related to this is only used when the moon reflects into a river. You see, in Japanese, words related to light are more specific, like this for the bioluminescence of the fireflies. Um, here, I'd also like to mention yakamos. Uh, that's a Turkish word that stands for the bioluminescence of a plankton that's commonly known as a sea sparkle. Um, talking about complexity, this means slight halo of light reflected on the snow after dark. I'm not kidding you, for real. So you can do this with the candles in winter, and it's pretty common to do in the Scandinavian countries. Instead, if we travel to the region home to Malayalam, many households practice the ritual of lighting the lamp at night and placing it in front of the main door. For an English speaker, this would rather be to have light in the dark. Instead, to a native, the idea of lighting the lamp at night means to cast away all evil forces of the night. Um, and I'd like to take one more moment to talk about candles. Um, in earlier colonial America, uh, homes were often miles apart, and the sight of a candle in a window from a distance was the sign of welcome to those wishing to visit. Rumored as one of the largest consumer of candles per capita, Denmark and other Scandinavian countries have embraced the power of warming glow candlelight. A simple lit candle seen, is seen as one of the most fundamental hygge moments to achieve. Strangely enough, in Swedish and Danish, Lus and Lis mean both light and candle. Scandinavian culture will need the talk apart. Uh, however, as you might notice if you walk in town, people don't seem particularly interested in curtains aside from their decorative aspects. This differs greatly from where I grew up in Italy. The first Sunday of Advent is the moment when the Christmas decorations come out in force in Scandinavia. The paper stars originated in Germany started to be imported in Sweden in 1930s. Later, the founder of H&M uh, created a cheaper version that was an instant success. The tradition spread quickly and has held fast. My favorite activity since I moved in Sweden is sitting quietly and pondering at dusk, if you can believe it. Um, it usually involves the privacy and coziness of a summer house and the candles lit at twilight. I find fascinating in Russian the subtle differences between the quantity of light before darkness. They have a word for half-light, dawn of the twilight, the pre-dawn half-darkness, and semi-darkness. And then the winter comes. In Finnish, kamos is the blue color of the sky when the sun does not rise at the horizon, the polar night. A very peculiar situation related to an interesting culture, Icelandic, has a word for describing the situation when there is just enough light to find your way. 
a Swedish and Finnish are also very intriguing people with the twisted sense of humor, maybe, since they have so many words for describing uh, the very dark night instead of saying pitch black. So many experiences of light in different cultures beg the question, does the language we speak influence the way we think? Do the words we use influence our thoughts? I think so, as well as our culture, our rituals. We have been talking about daylight since the mankind created the first language, the cave painting and carving. Electrical light is in European culture since 1800 and reached later other countries, so light in design language is definitely young, even if compared to architecture. Many architects, like Alvar Aalto in this example, embraced light and daylight as form giver for the architecture, and Lamp published a gorgeous book about it. You can still find it in many architects' studio. Richard Kelly proposed a very easy lexicon, not only the three elemental kinds of light, focal glow, ambient luminescence, play of brilliance, but also talking about intensity, brightness, diffusion, spectral color, direction, and motion. So I bet that collaborating with Khan and other architects, he developed a great understanding, not only trust. Kelly stated, light itself as a physical force can have specific qualities attributed to it by the regular occurrence of specific effects, as does the wind. And it demands a trained eye to recognize real and relative values, experience and knowledge of the cultural and physiological effects of light on people, experience and knowledge of physical techniques. Then, then something happened. Why did we stop talking the same language? Did the establishment of lighting design as a profession um, or as a separate dis discipline bring us far from the general public language? So, are there solutions? Can we push the evolution of the language? For example, there are evolutionists like FOSCOP, it's a non-profit think tank uh, that studies light as a focal issue and invites people to create new words. However, this is not based on linguistic studies. Like the Wayne, I do believe that professional practice of architectural lighting design could benefit from the application of theoretical linguistics. This discipline inquires into the nature of language, how it works, how it relates to other cognitive processes, and so on. Duane and his students at uh, Wismar have investigated the nature and development of the language of lighting design, and maybe by having the students look at lighting design through a window framed by language and culture, a better awareness of the, the quality of illuminated spaces can be achieved. There is more to light than enabling us to see, says Claudia Datsen. The first part of her research investigated cultural ideas of light using language and linguistics as a research tool, as displayed in this very powerful chart. Another approach could be learning from the food industry that used sensory science to evaluate in consumer products. This is the topic of Johanna Enger's research. The overall objective is to develop definitions and concepts for lighting quality, a basis for methods and tools for evaluation of design of light environments. The purpose of the study is to investigate how a selection of descriptive words is associated with various light qualities in the room. The study also compared the perceived contrast and brightness to the photoreceptor's response to logarithmic light intensity using the environmental light field measurement developed at Lund University. Please get in touch with Johanna if you wish for more info. Um, about me, uh, I'll keep on collecting unique words, also about daylight in architecture. And meanwhile, my next step is to examine closer the link, the link between the language we speak and the way we think, and hopefully give back to those uh, who contributed to my research so far. In fact, I couldn't prepare this presentation without the involvement of so many friends and uh, colleagues 
who helped me along the way. So, grazie, kitos, gracias, merci, tak, thank you. <laughs>